At St. Louis Acura, our customer-focused approach keeps earning us more inventory. As others increase their fees and take advantage of limited inventory, we keep our prices low because we remain committed to becoming better than ever and treating you as we want to be treated. We want you coming back and sending your friends and family to a veteran-owned, family-based business you can trust. Blessings for a wonderful holiday season and a prosperous new year from our families to yours. St. Louis Acura, better than ever for you. Hey, welcome back into Weekend Joe, driven by Munganas St. Louis Acura and Munganas Alton Toyota here on ClavesOnline.com. We've been talking about it. We've been giving away tickets for the Royal Rumble for the past few weeks now. And uh, our buddy Dave Green and his, uh, well, I, I guess, world of podcasts, and they, they just keep adding shows you knew about, the one that Conrad Thompson's doing coming up with Eric Bischoff and Jeff Jarrett, but now announced, uh, this is a big one, folks, at Hot Shots O'Fallon the day before the Rumble. It will be the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, and his co-host, my guest, Mark Madden, doing a live show the night before, and we welcome Mark onto the show. Mark, what's going on? How are you? Well, just counting on the days to get to St. Louis, um, really right outside in, in, in Illinois. And to do the first ever, my first ever anyway, live podcast with the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Uh, the tickets are moving briskly. I think all the VIPs are gone. So uh, we're expecting a big night. It's going to be uh, it's going to be fun. And you guys are at a, a great venue. Really, it's like five minutes from my house, too. So I, I absolutely love the uh, how close you guys are going to be on that uh, on that Friday night. Uh, we got to go all the way back to the beginning before we start talking about the stories and the stuff you guys are going to talk about. We know wrestling fans know your, your your history or they should know your history with WCW back in the day. Uh but I, I need to know where, how, how this came about, how you, you and Rick decided to uh, do a podcast together. Well, I don't know if people remember my history with WCW. I was there eight years from 93 through 2000. I got on TV the last year as the color commentator for Nitro. I was let go not long before WWE uh, bought the company. Uh, I had a dispute backstage with Diamond Dallas Page, and you know he had the company's ear always did. And, and that led to no good, even though Paige and I have uh, since mended fences. But uh, it was great to work there. Uh, one thing I'm actually proudest of, because I think I was a relatively mediocre color commentator, although I didn't work drunk on air. And you can take away from that what you will. But uh, we were real pioneers with the internet. That was when the internet first really became a staple of wrestling. And we did real audio. We did video streaming from house shows that were sold out. We just did a whole lot of relatively revolutionary stuff that seems commonplace in wrestling today, but was a big deal back then. And that was uh, people like myself and Jeremy Borash, who still works for WWE, uh, Bob Ryder, who passed away not too long ago and worked for a long time with TNA, Disco Inferno was a big part of that. All the boys would come on. It was just uh, a, a really groundbreaking time for wrestling with the internet. So. Uh, uh, that that pretty much, I think, was my biggest contribution. But uh, if people remember the TV, I'm honored. And it was definitely the time of my life. Now, in terms of my relationship with Rick, I've been friends with Rick dating back to the 80s. I used to write for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette newspaper. And I did a couple features on Rick and got to know him, you know, through those interviews and just going to see him after shows. And, uh, you know, here we are in 2021 doing a podcast in St. Louis, the weekend of the Royal Rumble. St. Louis being uh, one of the great wrestling cities in America. And of course, 30 years after Rick won the 1992 Royal Rumble, which is arguably the uh, greatest moment of his career. Yeah. And I, the history of Ric Flair in St. Louis and wrestling at the chase too. I, I, I the, the stories that he can tell and the stories that he won't tell that night are, uh, are probably legendary. Oh, I, Joe, I think nothing's off limits. I think he's going to, uh, talk about, for example, um, when he was the Black Scorpion under the mask to wrestle Sting at Starcade. That was at St. Louis. And I recall him running around the hotel wearing nothing but the mask and the Black Scorpion cape. So uh, I think he probably will tell that story. In fact, I, I think we might have alluded to it already on the podcast. Sting, Sting. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I don't think anything's off limits. And I think people who come to the live podcast 
are going to be in for a lot of entertainment. And plus, you get to meet Ric Flair. I mean, Ric Flair is Ric Flair. He's the greatest wrestler of all time. And uh, I think his cachet grows by the day. As wrestling, you know, Joe, the scene now in wrestling, it's kind of a mixed bag because people give it all kinds of critical acclaim. But less people watch wrestling in America now than ever have. You look at the numbers, they don't lie. The lack of house shows, the lack of territories. There used to be a lot more people watching. And I think in an environment like that, where the hardcore fans may love what they're seeing, but what they're seeing, that style, that five-star match type of thing, was pioneered by Ric Flair. So, you know, what's old always becomes new again, but Ric Flair never goes out of style. And, and, you know, and to that point with the, you know, just the access that people have to these wrestlers, I mean, to go see Ric Flair back in the day, and we, we talked about it beforehand. I, I, I used to do a show with Road Warrior Animal, and they, they wrestled. They were from the same era of wrestling. If you wanted to go see the Road Warriors and you wanted to go see Ric Flair, you had to go buy a ticket and you had to wait for them to come to your town where now you can jump on your phone and you can see what Rick's tweeting, I don't know, sometimes five times a day. Well, forgive me if I think it was better then, Joe. Uh, I just think it was a better environment. I think it was a better business model. Although you can't fault WWE because their TV deals are out of sight. They don't have to sell a ticket to make a, a gratuitous profit. AEW is run by a billionaire for his own vanity. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's done because he likes to be a wrestling booker. Don't get me wrong. AEW and Tony Khan have done a great job. I'm just trying to point out that the purpose of wrestling has changed a great deal mm -hmm. since the days we're talking about. Back then you had to draw money. With WWE, the money's already drawn because of the TV deal. With AEW, the money doesn't matter. And now guys from the era before that, the, the era of Ric Flair and into the 90s before the social media and the internet boom started, as you mentioned with that, everybody seems to be doing podcasts now to where they're telling the stories and they're kind of letting us into that in, into that world uh, of that. Uh, as there, I know you, you know, you're working with Rick. Uh, what other podcasts have you listened to or which other ones are you really enjoying when it comes to kind of pulling back that curtain 30 years later? I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, Joe, just because of time constraints with my radio job and the other things I do. I'm also a columnist uh, for the Tribune Review newspaper here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I write four times a week about sports, and I host a daily radio show on 105.9 The X from 3 till 6, which is about sports, but there's a lot of guy talk too. But the podcast I have listened to, I think Jeff Jarrett's amazing. I think he's a great storyteller. The same goes for Eric Bischoff. The same goes for Bruce Pritchard. I don't think it's a matter of who does the podcast, although having a name to get people in the door certainly helps. I think it's a matter of can they tell a story. What has been the biggest dispute that has happened so far in your uh, time with Rick uh, in your in your podcast with Rick that he has said something that one of the other podcasts or another former wrestler might have disputed? I don't pay much attention to that, to be honest. Uh, I, you know, has there been any? I, I don't know. I, I know sometimes Rick takes some shots at current wrestlers, but most he's very complimentary of those, you know, who are in the ring today. And uh, to be honest, my goal in St. Louis is to get Rick a little crazy, to get him to say stuff that, that he might regret saying later. I think that's part of the fun. <laughs> And that's you. You mentioned it too. I mean, there is going to be no holds barred and uh, in, in this show with uh, with, with Rick. Uh, do you have an idea of which uh, how you how you get things started with that, or how that well, uh, how you make that take, work? We're going to take some audience questions, which are always fun because, like uh, the late Rush Limbaugh once said, every time you take a phone call on a radio show, you're turning the broadcast over from a professional to an amateur, and uh, that usually leads to to hijinks and good fun. I know we're going to talk at great length about the 1992 Royal Rumble, where Rick went 60 minutes to win the WWE title for the first time. And that was really, uh, as I said earlier, maybe the biggest moment in Rick's career, because when he went from the NWA to WWE, finally, after all those years, it was very typical of WWE at that time to bury the big star who came in from the other promotion with the intent of building him back up, except they didn't always build him back up. You look at a guy like Ted DiBiase, who had great success in WWE, 
But he was just Ted DiBiase in the NWA, and he became the Million Dollar Man. He became a totally new character that paid no mind to his past or his accomplishments in the NWA. So for Rick to win that Royal Rumble showed that Vince McMahon really knew what he had. And he wasn't going to change it around, wasn't going to take that risk, wasn't going to indulge that vanity to try to do a makeover on a guy who was already so over. And we're also going to talk quite a bit about uh, St. Louis wrestling. It, actually, one thing that Rick did forget on the podcast, we were talking about the Missouri State Championship, which was a really big deal in Sam Muchnick's promotion in St. Louis. And Rick goes, I never won that. And then we looked it up, and of course he had. He had it for a brief time, uh, you know, back in the 80s. But uh, St. Louis wrestling, wrestling at the chase, was arguably the most credible wrestling in the United States, in the history of this country. The way it was presented, it was it was as close as wrestling ever got in the U.S. to being perceived as real sport because Sam Muchnick really piloted the territory that way. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that because back when I was younger and I was a tape trader, you know, stuff like that, I used to enjoy the St. Louis wrestling as much as anything. I thought the way it was presented was just marvelous. And if you juxtapose uh, St. Louis wrestling to, say, Memphis wrestling, which was just so over-the-top and crazy, you know, dating back through Jerry Lawler and even before that, you know, you, you realize how different the styles were across the country. Not so now, and that's sad. There's no difference between WWE and the way it's presented and AEW and the way it's presented. If you want to go further down the food chain, whether it's Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor, which I guess is on hiatus, it's all the same. It's it's a slightly different version of the same product. And uh, back then there was more variety, although you had to trade tapes to know that. Have you ever been to uh, the Chase? Have you ever been to Chase Park Plaza up here? No, I've not. I've not. Uh, I don't know what the plans are for that weekend, but I would like to check that out. I was going to say we can we can make that happen if you're around here for more than just uh, if you're just more than just an in and out. We can we can definitely well, I've not uh, pull got some my strings in. Jeff, but I'll take you up on that, Joe, if time permits, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, one thing, I, I, this is non podcast related, but to your career, your your radio career right now in in Pittsburgh, because you're a longtime wrestling guy and you're out there, you're talking, you're talking Penguins, you're talking Steelers. Right. I don't know, maybe two weeks out of the year, you're talking pirates. I don't know how maybe it works not. out there. <laughs> when, But having that background in wrestling and, and being on the air for as long as you have been, how do you work that into some of your stuff? Or do you just leave that leave that to be, uh, you know, well, just well, wrestling no, aside? No. I mean, I don't talk about wrestling that much. Uh, you know, we do. I do some drops. Like we do a thing called the Daily Flare at 445 every day where we play a soundbite from a Rick promo from back in the day that we get from YouTube, but mostly it's been more influenced than content. Like uh, one thing I learned from wrestling was how to polarize and control, how to manipulate ratings. I learned how to succeed in radio by working in wrestling. And I would not have had the success I've had in radio, you know, the number one sports guy in Pittsburgh for 26 years without having had that wrestling background that, that really taught me so much. Yeah. And I, you know, just knowing from the standpoint when I first started here in St. Louis and, you know, was a wrestling fan and I was on the air for seven, eight years before I, I got into the whole wrestling thing with, with animal, but just, you know, sprinkled in a little bit here and there and, you know, it could turn listeners off, but then there's that few out there that, that love it. But it's, it's amazing to me still in, you know, as we are a few days into 2022, there are still the the handful of people, if not more, that still want to remind you that wrestling's fake. And it's just like, okay, you know, it, it's one of those things where you say it and we're like, are we still doing this? I mean, that was, you know, that was cool to say in 99. One thing I will say, though, Joe, I think wrestling took a turn for the worse. And I think that's why the crowds, why the amount of people watching are so down now. I shouldn't say crowds because live events still, you know, do great business. There just aren't very many of them anymore. And they're almost always, you know, a, a TV show. But uh, but when they blew up kayfabe, they really hurt the business because everybody knew it was quote unquote fake back when. And I hate that word. But now they don't even let you suspend disbelief. On the uh, new podcast, Rick and I were talking about the AEW women's match where a couple women got color, where they bladed. 
and we talked about, you know, should should women be blading? Should anybody be blading? And I pointed out that in this day and age, everybody knows where the blood comes from. They know it's not because somebody threw a critical blow and turned the tide of battle. They know it's because somebody followed a script and got out a razor blade. So given that everybody knows that, I don't see any need to do it. And again, that's where totally destroying kayfabe, to my mind, has damaged the business. You're not supposed to know everything, but now, boy, we know more than everything. We we not only know, you know, uh, inside stuff like blading and, you know, the matches being scripted and the heel calls in the ring, except they never call in the ring anymore. We know who's banging who. We know who's divorcing who. We know way too much. And to be <laughs> fair, if the wrestlers don't like that, Joe, very often they're guilty of bringing their private life into the public eye. And once you do that, you can't suddenly say, wait, no, I don't want to do that today. Well, you already did it. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, with, with the, the ones that want to be out there on social media and want all of their life, you know, they have to take the good with the bad for, for so much of that. It's so hard for them to pick and choose what they uh, what they want to, to be known about them. Yeah, and I give a lot of credit to the wrestlers who manipulate uh, social media to their gain, like Sammy Guevara, who, who I think is the best young guy in AEW. And I think he's had better matches occasionally than guys like Daniel Bryan. Well, Bryan Danielson, he's called now, except he's not allowed to. Nobody's allowed to rate a match better than a match Bryan Danielson has. I, I think that's against the law, Joe. I think that can actually get you arrested in Missouri. But, <laughs> but he has a uh, a vlog that he's had since the beginning of his career in the Indies, like dating back 10 years. And it has over 200,000 YouTube subscribers, if I'm not mistaken. And that's really valuable to a guy like that. Uh, I think Ethan Page does the same thing. He doesn't yeah, he have does. that audience. There's being the elite too, which has been around for a long time. And that enables those guys to stay over, even when they're not necessarily on TV every week or when they're, you know, in a bit of a lull storyline wise. So I give those guys a lot of credit for that. I know Tony Khan thinks you can rotate guys off TV and they can become stars. He's just saying that because he's hired 15 pounds of sugar to fill his 10-pound bag. He has way too many guys. He has more guys all the time. He's not going to be able to keep everybody happy. So he says, well, we're going to rotate guys off to keep them fresh. Joe, I'm sure you've watched enough wrestling. You can answer. Did they ever rotate Hulk Hogan off TV? No, no. Unless he was filming, uh, what was it, Thunder Bay? No, uh, yeah, Thunder in Paradise. Thunder in Paradise, Hulk yes. Hogan. Did they ever rotate Steve Austin off TV? Did they ever rotate The Rock off TV? Of course they did. not But again, power to those uh, wrestlers who have found a way to use social media to keep themselves over regardless of what's happening on TV. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just the, and, you know, back in the day too, uh, you talk, you know, Rick working, what, 350 days a year in some, you know, back in the day too. I think his high, we've talked about this. I think his high for the year, I think he did 381 year because he did double shots almost every Saturday and Sunday. So I would assume that, that I mean, low ball figure would probably be 330 for his high. But, you know, Rick, I, I give Jericho credit. Jericho kept that book with every match and how it went, his entire career, and then he published it. Uh, I wish Rick would have done that. Boy, that would be an interesting read. Oh God. Yeah. Just, I mean, some of those guys that, that did, I mean, just the, the stories from the road of getting from one to the other. And I, I just, you know, the, the traveling back and forth too, if they, if there was something they had to go back home for and come back the next day, just the way that they did that back in the day with travel and just having a stack of tickets, plane tickets and going to that. It's just some of the crazy stories that those guys have. Well, especially the touring NWA world champions, Joe. Nobody led a life like they did. And there's only three of those guys left, you know. Uh, Ric Flair, Terry Funk, Dory Funk Jr. And to me, they are national treasures. Uh, they lived a life and had an experience as crazy as wrestling can be. They had the craziest. They did something that very few did. So you're going to be here in St. Louis in uh, just about a little over three weeks doing the show Friday night. Actually, by the time this airs, it will be three weeks uh, till the night that you guys will be at Hot Shots in O'Fallon doing the uns uh, the uncensored Ric Flair podcast, uh, Woo Nation. The uh, and uh, 
I, I, have you looked? Have you, do you watch the current product? Have you paid any attention to what the Rumble card is going to look like on Saturday night? Well, I don't think it's really shaped up just yet. You know, it's going to have the, the men's and women's Rumble, but as far as the main events go, I I, I mean... We know Lesnar-Lashley is one of the matches, and that's... Yeah, that I mean, just that's... got made, right? Because Lesnar, Lesnar couldn't wrestle Roman because of COVID. Yeah. He got put in that five-way. I, I did see that match. I'll, I'll be honest, Joe, I'm not all that impressed with a lot of the product these days. So I tend to tape the shows and then fast forward to stuff I like. Uh, I did watch that five-way... I'm a big fan of Brock. I think Brock is a baby face, is uncharted waters, but I think it's going great so far. Uh, so Brock and Bobby, I like the fact that WWE is going back to a lot of big man stuff, not overwhelmingly so, but my God, and this is no knock on the guys, but you look at like Jungle Boy and CM Punk and they're great performers, but I'm from the larger than life era. Now don't get me wrong. Both those guys have larger than life personas, but I like a larger than life you know, big guy in the ring occasionally doing big guy things too. So again, not knocking, but boy, it's come full circle when Brock and Bobby, two big guys, butting heads like big horn rams, you know, the business has come full circle when something like that is different and refreshing because it used to be every main event was that. I was just talking to say, you mentioned how big Lashley is. And I've, so I've never seen Brock up close. I've never, oh. I've never been in the same room oh. as him. But I have, so it was um, New Orleans WrestleMania a few years ago. This is right after, this was Tuesday, so Lashley just returned to WWE, so he was just on Monday Night Raw, and I'm walking through the New Orleans airport, and I look up, and there is just this massive human, and I'm like, you know what, like, you know he's ripped, you know he's a big guy, but you see him in person, and you're just, it's, holy shit, like this. The sheer stuff. bulk, the sheer <laughs> volume. Yeah, right. it's Brock, Bobby. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Bobby because Bobby, you know, went to Impact Wrestling for a while and really reinvented himself and made yeah. himself that much better. The same goes for Drew McIntyre, who I'm a big fan of. So, again, I like that it's getting back back to, to big guys. Like, you know, I'm not a big believer in the five-star match concept. I, I just don't care about that. The only barometer that means anything in wrestling is, did it draw money? Did it get people to buy the pay-per-view? Did it get them to turn on the TV? And five-star matches very often do that, but so do two yeah. big guys like Brock and Bobby butting heads. And you want something that's going to make you keep turning back in week after week and see how that develops. I've, I've said, you you know, I, I don't have to sit here and, and tell you how successful the NWO was and that, and that angle, but something you remember back in Impact, the Aces and Eights, that program that they ran back in the day, I, I remember having to watch TNA every week to see what was going to happen next with that storyline because it kind of grabbed you in. It was like, okay, is there going to be a reveal? Is there going to be a new member? Stuff like that is what I feel like gets people tuning back in to see that. They're just not going to tune back in and go, oh, what's the main event? Okay, I'll, I'll check back in at 940. Anything involving Brooke Adams dressed in a biker outfit gets me to tune in. So <laughs> I, I was a fan of that angle as well. And, and like, you know, there was a big fuss made over – over the uh, the 60 minute draw on AEW with Brian Danielson and Hangman Page. And I watched it and it was very, very, very good. I mean, it was five stars. I give it, you know, full credit. I don't know if I want to watch a match for an hour, Joe. I don't know if my attention span really thinks something like that is that important. I did watch it though, so they won that one. Yeah, that was just the commercial that I didn't, you know, I, I know you got to make commercials. I mean, you and I both know we got to, you got to pay the bills somehow, but to have four or five commercials during a match is uh, commercial breaks during a match. It's just like, okay, we're, we know yeah, where this is headed. Picture in picture thing though, too. The, the one thing I, I, I don't like about AEW is, and I really bought into it for a long time and I still watch it from beginning to end on Wednesdays. But when it, that promotion opened up, it was it was Sammy Guevara, it was MJF, it was Jungle Boy, it was Hangman Page, it was Darby Allen, it was Britt Baker. It was guys I hadn't seen before on TV who were great, and I really like that. And now they've kind of been not edged out, but but you know put in a lesser position because they're recycling the WWE guys. And that's not that Punk and Danielson are great performers; they can't show me anything I haven't seen. I want to see right. new stuff from underexposed t 
talents. And now the promotion belongs to Danielson and Puck. They're on yeah. every week. I think Danielson's been there 14 or 15 weeks. He's wrestled on TV 16 or 17 times. But everybody else is getting rotated off TV. Okay. He is Mark Madden. You can see him with the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, January 28th. It starts at 6 o'clock at Hot Shots in O'Fallon, Illinois. It's the, I, I believe Justin Boyd calls it the Camden Yards of Hot Shots <laughs> there in O'Fallon, <laughs> Illinois. They got the Yankee Stadium one, I think, over in Fenton, I think, is the, uh, the Yankee Stadium of Hot Shots. I believe they refer to O'Fallon as the Camden Yards. Well, of, no, I of hot wait, shots. And, I, and I know Rick can't either. You know, one thing I've had to do, and, you know, I learned a lot of how to talk from watching Ric Flair, okay? Like, I always say that my radio persona in Pittsburgh is based on Ric Flair and an old-timey Pittsburgh radio guy who mentored me named Doug Hurt. So when I work with Rick, I can't talk like Rick. That would be overkill. I mean, I don't do the woo and stuff like that, but just, you know, my delivery, my – my my timing, my pacing, especially, is dependent on on Rick. So, but it's been a great time doing the podcast. There is only one Rick Flair. I mean, nobody's come along that has truly, I don't think, duplicated his level of charisma, promo mobility combined with in-ring success. Nobody did it longer. Nobody has the unique stories besides Terry and Doria being the NWA touring world champ. Nobody has the universal respect in the business that Rick Flair does. And, and, and somehow, go figure, I mean, I guess I believed in bloodlines, but not like this. His daughter, Charlotte, is the best women's wrestler ever. Mm -hmm. So you, you put all that together, boy, what a package that's still very relevant today. So I think it's going to be a great night. The uh, As you mentioned earlier, you thought the VIP were sold out. They are sold out. So you can yes. only get the standard seating for the show that'll go from uh, 7 to 9. Again, those VIP ones, they they can start coming in at 6 o'clock. It's a 7 to 9 show. Two hours of Ric Flair uncensored at Hot Shots. Go to RicFlairLive.com. RicFlairLive.com. We will put a link there in the uh, in the YouTube video. We'll put it up on Claves Online to where people can go and see Ric Flair Live, the, uh, the Woo Nation uncensored podcast coming to you at Hot Shots in O'Fallon. Mark, thank you so much, man. I will see you at Hot Shots in a few weeks. Joe, thank you. Great stuff. Looking forward to seeing you. At St. Louis Acura, our customer-focused approach keeps earning us more inventory. As others increase their fees and take advantage of limited inventory, we keep our price low because we remain committed to becoming better than ever and treating you as we want to be treated. We want you coming back and sending your friends and family to a veteran-owned, family-based business you can trust. Blessings for a wonderful holiday season and a prosperous new year from our families to yours. St. Louis Acura, better than ever for you.